luck. Um, we thought we'd start with something crazy at the beginning. In Prague last year, we had the same BOF with a lot less people. And there were two outcomes of that talk. There was, we were discussing the C++ 98 to C++ 11 transition for ABIs. And in that talk, we just, there were kind of two main vectors. One was we need some kind of tagging mechanism for symbols for ABIs. And the other thing is we need better tooling to, for us to analyze ABIs. And this year, we'd like to present the current status on both of those things because there have been some developments. And so Jason is going to talk about tagging. And Doji's going to talk a little bit about um, our new form of an analysis. And then I'm going to probably do some hand waving afterwards. So with that, I'm going to give this to Jason. Does this one work? Not oh, particularly. So. Yeah. OK. So how's that? So ABI. The, the primary motivation for making a change is uh, complexity requirements that are new in the C++11 standard that uh, prohibit our current implementation. Uh, for string, uh, the, current, the current implementation is a reference counted copy on write thing that is no longer, no longer meets the requirements of the standard. And for list, you need to be able to take the length of the linked list in constant time. And so we need to add the length to, to the body of the class. So uh, to be fully compliant with, uh, with the C++11 library requirements, we need to make a change. However, changing ABIs is a real pain. Uh, particularly so in, in the ELF world, where you've got a flat uh, namespace for, for all symbols. Uh, you load a symbol and a, a library, and the symbols all get uh, squished into the same namespace with everyone else. Now, uh, for, for plugins, uh, this, is, this issue is reduced somewhat uh, through use of DLopen with RTLD local. However, um, to deal with other C++ issues, a while back we introduced a relocation form STB GNU Unique, which uh, punches through our, the protection of RTLD local, uh, so that basically uh, template static data members are are actually shared. So since since the symbols are the same through the whole program, uh, any changes in the meaning of a symbol. In, in, one, uh, in one library affect everything else and uh, can cause bad problems at runtime. Now the old way to deal with ABI changes was to, uh, to bump the, the SO name of the shared library so that uh, you would, uh, old programs would be linked against an old library and new programs would be linked against a new library and they didn't have to worry about the other one. Uh, that doesn't really work uh, for us uh, that requires a lot of unnecessary breakage because most of the symbols aren't, aren't affected and so users that, that are only using a limited uh, subset of the library uh, don't necessarily need to make any changes. Uh, the, the bigger issue with SO name change is that it doesn't, it doesn't protect from having multiple definitions of the same symbol loaded at the same time, particularly since in C++, a lot of the, the library symbols are not in libsyd C++ at all. They're in, in uh, user code or third-party libraries. So it really doesn't help. Now, uh, to deal with the limitations of SO name uh, versioning, uh, a while back, Sun uh, introduced uh, individual symbol versioning, uh, which was later extended uh, by the GNU tools. Uh, this, this seems like it, it, could, it could do the job, but it's limited to, uh, to certain platforms. 
Uh, in C++, we have something uh, that also seems appropriate. Uh, since most symbol names are, are mangled to express uh, type context and function parameter names and whatnot, we can just uh, change the, the mangled name to, to reflect the different versions. So we've introduced the ABI tag attribute, which can be applied to a declaration or a type, and that says that uh, this, this name uh, is, has now has the, the ABI signified by, by this tag. So I'm missing a close paren there. Uh, and you can specify multiple tags uh, if, as ABI changes stack up, I suppose. And if you, if you tag your, your class foo, and then you use foo as a parameter of a function, then the, the mangling change to foo affects the mangling of f, and, it, and that just uh, goes through automatically. Unfortunately, not all uses of, of a type uh, show up in the mangling. Uh, specifically, uh, if you have a base class of, uh, of a class, the, the bases are not part of the mangled name of the derived class. Uh, function return types for non-template functions are not part of the mangled name. Ian. Do you um, currently assume the tags are global in the sense that every um, name that has a given tag is assumed to be compatible with itself? So you don't have to stack up the tags if you have multiple members? Right. That uh, we expect that, that a particular tag will be applied to to multiple things at around the same time. And so in effect, we have a new global namespace of tags. Right. Okay. So in these cases, uh, we need to deal with uh, making sure that things that, that use these types are, are also appropriately tagged. Now, for function return types and, and variable types, this is pretty straightforward. We see the we see the type, it has a tag, we say, okay, then we need to apply this tag to the, to the declaration as well. Uh, that's not actually implemented yet, though. Uh, the, but the, the difficult case is the use of uh, forward declared types, and uh, even more so, uh, opaque types, where we have no idea what the definition of, of the type is, so we don't know whether it needs a tag. So uh, the ways we could approach this are uh, propagate the tags automatically as much as we can and reject code where that fails. Uh, the, problem, the main problem with this is that it would break uh, perfectly well-formed code that just doesn't happen to, to deal with our, our tag extension. Um, if we don't do that, then we're relying on, on the user to get the, the tag propagation right. Uh, but that's, that's the way we're going to go. Uh, because, uh, despite, uh, besides the, the issue with rejecting well-formed code, my belief is that most C++ users uh, are rebuilding most of their code anyway. And so the, the r relatively small uh, group of users that are relying on, use, on link compatibility with older code uh, from third-party libraries or coexisting uh, with other plugins and that sort of thing. Uh, but for those, for those users that do care about compatibility, we've added a, a warning about cases where we see, well, this base class has this tag, and the drive class does not have this tag, so you probably want to add that tag to the drive class. Um, there are, are some cases that, that the, the warning is, is just not going to catch. Uh, for instance, a case where, the, where a class depends on the size of uh, a list, say. <coughs> so, uh, along with the tagging, I think it's important to have uh, an ABI checker, verifier. They'll make sure that 
the assumptions of, of your code match the assumptions of the, these other libraries that you're trying to link with. And so I had been talking about uh, making the, the ABI change in 4.9, but uh, it's not clear that we're going to have the verifier in that, in that time frame. And so I think it makes the most sense for us to wait until that's ready before we, we actually make this change. And with that, I hand you over to Doji. It's not that complicated. Oh, it works. How is that? You hear me? No? Is it okay? Or okay, yeah? Okay. Sorry? Oh, okay. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, so, I'm going to talk about the um, the verifier part of of, of uh, this ABI thing. Um, mostly, first, I'd like to uh, to uh, you know define what I would call the you know problem space. What are we trying to, to tackle here. Then uh, it will be nice to talk about uh, the existing solutions um, that we can find around and uh, talk about you know, their limitation and hence what we're proposing and, uh, and, uh, and then you know, what needs uh, to be done. So, Suppose you have a program that links to, to a library, you know, that, you know, dynamically. Will that program keep linking with the next version of the library? That's pretty easy as a problem statement, I guess. To, the nice thing will be to be able to uh, answer that question only by looking at the two versions of the library. I mean, not taking into account the program itself. You don't necessarily have it. Right. And there are many va variations of these kind of uh, kind of you know questions. For instance, if you're uh, you have a program loading uh, dynamically, you know, a DSO, or the symbols of uh, the program and the DSO compatible, whatever compatible means. And I guess you can have other kinds of questions like that. So, I've been looking at you know, many stuff, uh, many existing programs around, and in my opinion, if you don't agree, you know, like raise your hand and this is a buff, right? Um, in my opinion, one of uh, the general rules uh, um, you know, we're saying is that most of the time we're getting the types and symbols from the binary uh, somehow. I mean, usually it's from the dwarf uh, information. Um, and uh, some programs, you know, some verification programs also go and parse the headers um, of uh, li the libraries and, and, you know, to get a su superset of, of, of the symbols um, they're interested in. This is Important also because you know in the headers you can have inline functions uh, that are not present in the final um, you know the final binary and hence I mean you miss them if you're just looking at the binary stuff right and usually from what I've seen there is no compiler support for for, for, for this I mean uh, they're usually like you know grep based you know parsing. Um, you know, hacks, um, oh, sorry, uh, involved programs. Uh, <laughs> English is not my native language, so. <laughs> Forget. <laughs> so, okay, so they're listening. I thought they were like, <laughs> they were sleeping. And, okay, so that was the first joke. I have others. 
So, uh, uh, it even gets worse uh, when those inline stuff are templates because, you know, go parse, go parse, you know, like the real template stuff, you know, in C11 with, you know, all our type traits and. Why stop there? Exactly. <laughs> I didn't say hacks, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, really, it gets tricky without compiler support, you know, uh, having all those uh, information. Here, I think it would be nice to define ABI. Let's okay, define our. Uh, usually, people think that it's you know the binary stuff, you know, the only symbols and you know types in the binary. But I think it will be interesting to augment that and say it's the API of of the thing we're interested in, plus uh, you know plus what we were thinking uh, about what we were thinking about ABI classically, you know, so the superset of it, right? Uh, there is a nice tool called ABI Compliance Checker. You know that, that thing? Uh, okay, there are many tools there, but this one is pretty nice because it has really nice uh, reports, things that you know you can understand if you speak English. You know, this kind of, you know, just have to speak English and know programming a bit. And so I like to walk you through uh, its user interface so that, you know, in my mind, it's a nice way to specify what we want, what we want to do, right? So, suppose you want to, uh, to check the ABI compatibility for two versions of uh, this uh, dying thing, dying thing. I mean, it's disappearing now, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, so, uh, ABI Compliance Checker uh, wants you to define what a library is. So, you just define a small uh, library descriptor here saying, you know, this is the version of my thing, this is where the headers are, um, this is where the binary itself is, and blah, 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 blah. So you define this for the two versions of, of your library, and then you just run this. You know, give me, you know, give me, basically, you know, give me the um, report about the differences, ABI differences between the, the, two, uh, the two versions here. And then you get a nice report. But OK, at this point, it becomes less uh, professional, right? Um, uh, where's the? Yeah, it's here. Uh, so you get a report like this. And uh, you know, you see that you, can ha you, you have probably you have some problems related to data types. And you know, it's pretty, pretty slick. And then you click here to see the, the, the you know, high-risk issues. And you see it's, the problems are highlighted in English. And you know, there is no you know, the things like the fourth entry of the V, you know, v table tables is blah, 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 blah. No, no, it's just, you know, you can have problems, basically, is what he says. So you know, nice reports. But then it doesn't support. Uh, the thing, the tricky things I was, I, I was talking about, you know, template stuff. Uh, imagine, for instance, you have a template function in your in your in your library header, uh, and that function takes one parameter, um, and it's never um, it's never instantiated in the binary itself, right? And suppose in the next version of the library, you just add a new parameter to that template function. If you ship that library like that, the programs that were compiling against the first version will stop compiling because, in effect, you removed a, fun you know, a function, right? And this thing won't, won't, fl you know, won't catch that, uh, or variation of, of uh, these kind of issues. So it will be nice to be able to augment uh, these kind of tools, right? Not, anyway. But, yeah, I was a bit uh, ahead of my time. So in that case, we're helpless. So what we're proposing for that is to have the compiler, you know, uh, emit um, meta information about what he's, you know, putting in the binary as far as uh, ABI, um, is concerned. So 
So having DOMS is nice and cool and everything, but if what we want is to be able to analyze those DOMS, you know, make diffs, you know, visualize things, you know, uh, make reports, and uh, the ABI compliance checker stuff, it's written in Perl, it grabs things like, you know, real human beings, right? But I'm not that smart, right? I, I mean, I mean it's, it, <laughs> It's, it's, it will be nice to have you know, a library that shields you um, against all those small details of you know, reparsing that you know, XML stuff again and again and again. And, you know, and have the library help you manipulate stuff like you know, symbols, you know, uh, template functions, and you know, put at the, 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 the parameters of the template, you know, walk them, and these kind of things. So this is where this uh, library we're, we've been thinking of uh, which is, and uh, what's the, uh, what the acronym? Uh, the a is ABI General Analysis and <laughs> Library or something. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, it's a proposal, you know. Yeah. This is a buff, right? And, uh, and it will be nice to, 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 uh, to, you know, use that library from GCC itself to emit the stuff instead of, you know, fprintf, you know, like angle bracket brrr, and, you know, XML stuff. Nah, nah. So just use the library to say, okay, this is a, this is a, you know, I don't know, this is a type. It's an enum, you know, like new enum, boom, add it to the um, translation unit and save, boom, you know, uh, this kind of abstraction level. So, GCC will use, will use the, the library to emit the dump and, and the consumers uh, will do the same as well. And uh, with that thing, we could be able to augment you know, the, the existing tools uh, um, you know, that know already how to you know, spit nice reports and, 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 and all that. And even though those tools are in, in Perl, right? Uh, you know, I know that we are in, Py in a Python shop here, so, you know, yeah, parallel. Uh, but we, they're, anyway, so, <laughs> they're, yeah, they're not slipping. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I don't think I have other jokes. <laughs> uh, so, um, just to have a sense of, of, of what that library could do, uh, you have, suppose you have this, uh, extremely, you know, involved uh, C++11 code. Uh, a way to use that, at least at the, the beginning, you know, when we're prototyping stuff and, you know, uh, is to have uh, a new flag here that will dump uh, the ABI of that, uh, you know, transaction unit. And uh, the ABI file will look like this. BI will be binary information or something. Uh, so pretty straightforward stuff. You know, like, if you want to look at the code again to make sense of, oh, we are at Google here. People are fast. OK. <laughs> so <laughs> and uh, no, no, seriously. Um, so yeah, it's pretty straightforward, uh, pretty straightforward format. And you know, we define, uh, we can define types. Uh, and refer to those types. For instance, the, the in, enum here has an underlying type which is type ID one here, and it's a short int, you know, like it's this thing here. So pretty straightforward. So, and just to have a sense of what uh, the, the uh, use uh, of the library will be, uh, the library will define types like you know translation unit. A reader that lets you, you know, just read the uh, read the file, uh, read the binary instrumentation, and into a translation unit. And if you want to walk uh, the stuff, for instance, and get at oh, sorry, get at uh, uh, the members and see if the thing is a function template, you know, and you know, blah blah blah. It's I think it's pretty obvious stuff, right? Uh, so. Actually, we do have some code that is not, you know, really released yet. But it's just we it's getting there. Yeah, it's getting yeah. there. We, we're you know, it's prototyping. Just you know, 
in a way, uh, know what we're talking about, you know. So today, the, temp the, the library can represent, you know, ABI artifacts, you know, basically types and decals and things like that, um, up to templates, function templates, um, class templates, things like that. Um, we have a branch of uh, G++ only, uh, not, not the C compiler yet, but it's just that you know, we had to st start somewhere, yeah. right? Uh, that emits the representation of you know, stuff up to you know, classes, their virtual uh, functions, uh, virtual bases, you know, these kind of things. So it's vapor, but not completely. You know. uh, uh, we have basic testing support, uh, you know, so, well, I won't get into the details of that, but, you know, we can test um, stuff in, 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 in our um, um, GCC regression test harness. But there are a lot of uh, things to do, obviously, you know, this is kind of, you know, live prototyping. And so, when you think about it, you know, for, you know, uh, Okay, when you're building a program, you're, you're essentially uh, putting together uh, several, uh, you know, object files that are, uh, the, you know, translated units, right? And what I showed there was that for one translation unit, we were emitting, you know, one binary uh, description, right? It, it would be nice to have archives of those binary stuff, like, you know, that represent the, uh, the program as an archive of object files, right? So I guess that thing, could be put, you know. Like we're doing the documentation XML file. Yeah, put something like that. Yeah. yeah. And we could uh, stuff that into the ELF and, you know, non loadable ELF section, you know, whatever, things like that. And of course, it's important to you know, write, you know, the diffing, sec diffing stuff. But as you've seen in the report of the tool, you know, it's not a. Uh, well-defined problem domain. I mean, you, you'll start by saying, okay, I'll start uh, defining what it means to, you know, have a new function. Like, I, I, I want to, to detect that a new function was added. But then you want to know if, uh, no, uh, the same function was there and I added a const, for instance. You know, this kind of, it's an iterative, you know, process. And then someone will uh, release the library and say, whoops, it broke. Well, I tested it okay, I, I didn't catch this thing, and I will go back and, you know. So this is why I think it is important to have a library, so that each time you change something in the format, you don't have to go and change all the consumers, you know, dwarf anyone. Like, <laughs> uh, you know, when we change dwarf, we have to modify Volgrin, GDB, you know, all the consumers, all the, you know, okay. So, actually, no, you don't. In, in practice, yes, we do. I'm sorry. Uh, do you add new attributes, uh, new I mean, if you want the the, the uh, if you want if you want the uh, the features the feature to be present in 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 those consumer today, you don't have like a single library that you will have just updated and you know we in practice go and change basically all the consumers, right? In practice, Actually, we, we end up having to change GDB, Valgrind, yeah. uh, parts of uh, LP bills. Uh, it's, not, it's not a bad thing. You have to do it anyway. But it would yeah. be nice if we, you know, for new stuff, we <laughs> save our time uh, regarding that. So, yeah, and of course, add support for missing constructs. We have a lot of missing constructs. For instance, you know, template expressions, these kind of things. There are a lot of them, and it's okay. But, you know, uh, you know, do the programming for the next stuff. And of course, publish the thing. And okay, for that, I, it's coming soon, real soon now. You know, famous uh, <laughs> last words. Free software. So. Yeah, could you go back to your slide where you showed the XML? Um, it's dwarf in XML. No. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> So yeah. why, why duplicate the information that's currently in work in, in yet another format, in yet another section, in, in another That's a good question. Uh, Let's talk about this. I'll let. <laughs> what instances aren't really being represented in Dwarf the way we need them to be? Uh, and perhaps that would be a good extension for Dwarf. 
Um, yeah, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah. No, seriously. I mean. No, I, 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 reinventing the wheel is a really time-honored tradition. <laughs> <laughs> this is. But yeah. if, if you're describing the the values for a for a, uh, an enumeration, that's there. If you're describing yeah, don't the mangle names, I would there. say. This is really specifically for C++ and templates is part of this design decision. And we just didn't have that info in door. So and the, what the example you're looking at is not that. So Yeah, because I want it to fit in my slide. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. so give you an idea. When I, when I saw this, my first thought was this is just converting you can convert to and from door. And there's really nothing to get it. It's not represented in door. But the problem they're, they're trying to solve is there are things that it doesn't make sense right now to put them in work. If you have an understanding uninstantiated template, why would you add that to the debug information for, for a shared library? It's I mean, it would literally be megabytes and megabytes, yeah, and Dwarf is already such a huge format. So why would we be adding stuff that is not really going to be used? Or maybe we should. Separate out the issues. Oh, yeah. 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 So that's yeah. issue. so if, if there are issues around the size of Dwarf, uh, folks here at Google are addressing that in, in ways, and there are other ways. So separating out the size issue seems to be a, a totally irrelevant matter to whether you do a whole new data, a whole new representation to do the same thing that Dwarf is doing. And if Dwarf is doing 90% of it, you know, focus on the 10% that it's not doing. Sure. And, and if you want to have uninstantiated templates to describe in Dwarf, I, 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 would, I would see it this way. This is uh, an iterative process of knowing what, of discovering what we want. Sure. So once we know it, and I think we will know it when we see our problem solved, right? Then I think we can, we, we will be in a good position to say, okay, this is what we should add to dwarf, you know, in a minimal way as possible. And then, because what you say it makes sense, the ABI checker stuff, for instance, is consuming dwarf. So if I want to augment it today, <coughs> and I augment dwarf, then it, you know, it yeah, all it is. Right. So, but I mean, I don't see myself coming today and say, okay, th this is what I want to do. And I don't know what I want to do exactly. You know, I, 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 we really need to, you know, uh, um, play with, with, with things and, 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 you know, define the problem space uh, precisely first and uh, so yeah um, i'm not uh, i'm not saying it as uh, you know we're we doing you know reinventing the world because maybe in two or three years from now it will be a dwarf extension who knows yes maybe a good way to, to, to say that is right now we know that temp unaccessible templates are a problem in terms of, of ABI verification um, there is a sense that there are other things working that we don't know what they are yet we kind of like to have a better idea of what the problem space is. And, and then I think that's about time to go back and say, all right, so given that we, we have a good handle on the problem space, where does it make sense to put the data that allows us to check? Right now, we we're just trying to get a handle on the problem space. Certainly, we're aware of the overlap, for sure. Yeah, great. The, the, original, the original problem was that you wanted to describe the ABI for a library. You're describing the ABI for a translation. Right. Is the library just a concatenation of the two? Or you yeah, it's going. Sort of yeah, or? yeah, exactly. There is. It, it will be the concatenation of the two plus type merging and and this kind of thing. The library has support for hashing types. You know, this kind of is this is is that your question or, you know, like yeah, okay, type merging stuff. Yeah. As a follow-up, so. And then you also wanted to be able to say, okay, I have a binary here that's linked against version one. Exactly. Exactly. Is it compatible with version two? Exactly. What's in the binary? That do you have the same thing in that in that binary that you're going to compare against the ABI definition from version one and version two of the library it depends on? Mm -hmm. How is that going to work? Another way to ask that is what you've got here is you're describing the type definitions, but in the binary, what you really need to be saying is I'm using these types from this shared library. So this plus code coverage? You want like a code coverage? No, I'm not talking about code coverage, but I mean, 
Yeah. What, what matters for ABI checking of a binary linked against shared libraries is the types that the binary uses from the shared library. But right. what, if what I see here is a description of type definition. Yeah, there's so, and type definition and symbols. Approach that makes it more conservative, which is going to say this doesn't try to figure out what the users are. It basically, doesn't try to help you figure out when you can cheat it because nobody cares about that field. Right. Um, the, uh, it, it helps you verify that you know version one and version two are uh, you know compatible in all uh, ways other than you know semantics. So what you're saying is the tool works to verify that a shared library has the same ABI. Yeah. The, the same or compatible. Superset. Yeah, superset. You know, or you know, uh, or these are the changes. You know, just yeah. that, just that. But the original goal was you know there are differences. And you know what they are, but you want to know if, if a binary is safe regardless of those differences. What do you mean by Jason, safe? Jason's argument for deferring the changes to, from 4.9 to, to something later was to wait for this tool to help you check that a binary was going to be okay even though we know the two libraries have different. Exactly. So how, I, I'm but, but I mean, on how this is going Jason. To yeah, just, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there are basically two different Two different uses we're trying to support here. Um, one uh, that you've been talking about is: am, is my is my program in danger of uh, is my program going to have ABI problems? And for that, you don't need to know anything about uninstantiated templates because they're uninstantiated, so nobody cares. Uh, where we care about uninstantiated templates is from the uh, library packagers' perspective, like. I'm, I'm shipping a new version of the library. Yeah. Is it going to cause ABI problems for any of my customers? Yeah. So this is going to help answer the question that we already know the answer to for, for GLC. For GLC. Well, uh, but we're, we're focused more on the C++ world. <laughs> right. Well, uh, the, but, yeah. the, goal, no, the, goal, the goal of the tagging is to not, is to not create is to not have any symbols that uh, that change ABI, not to have any names that change ABI, because the things that are changing ABI are also changing their name. And so this, and so the idea is that this will verify that we caught all of the names that are changing their ABI, and okay. and change the, their names. So this is really a tool for libraries. Uh, and for yes. yes. And sorry. For binaries. For yeah. But why is it a tool for binaries? Binaries, who cares if the ABI changes from one version of a binary to another? Well, Google doesn't, but Red Hat customers do. What, in what sense? Well, if they're dynamically linked. <laughs> if they're dynamically well, loading the DSOs, binaries, for instance. The binary, so the, binary the unlinked, just without any of the dependencies, you mean? Oh, OK, dependent, yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you have a new version. I mean, you, you're never going to have two different versions of of a binary running at the same time because that doesn't even make sense. But so the binary once can load plugins and those plugins right. can access symbols in the binary. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So clearly Mozilla. I, I feel anyway. like we'll have a lot more experience with the binary yeah. question later. Yeah. Um, after we can scale up a little bit. I have no idea of the time. Are we okay? Uh, yeah, we're yeah, okay, we right? Yeah, we've got like a more. Oh, All right, yeah, so, yeah. Roland. So, I want to raise a couple different things. Yeah. So, I want to so, yeah. um, yeah. so, obviously, right. um, it's for Lucy and the world in general, but for Lucy, which is why I care about the, uh, yeah. we have the need for the same kind of tool. Exactly. Maybe I could want to check around. Oh, you have a good thing. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and that you know, seems to do pretty well for uh -huh. what we need. Oh, so tool help. It's the interface. Uh, for all some guy I don't know from, so yeah. I don't know how much I can capture. But um, so uh, we don't care about C++, so like the web simpler. We don't have all the templates and all that stuff. The um, interfaces are one to one. Right. Yeah. Um, no. But so the things well, that I wanted to uh, bring up are But that's the one issue. Uh, so the 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 approach that we've mostly taken is just the pure API approach. So that's, yeah. You know, that's our right. primary that, 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 that's um, yeah. We are also interested in uh, 
the API changes yep. so that I you know I want to see not necessarily in the you know XML or whatever the format is, but in the presentation a clear distinction between ABI issues Agreed. and API issues. Yeah. Um, there's also some um, in in C there's a lot more fuzzy cases maybe. So um, we have situations like, so okay, so one thing is the ABI versus API. Right. In the ABI space, there's we have sort of fuzzy cases, which I guess maybe you could come up with you could have in your C uh, uh, in your in your private fields, you know, but in C we you know regularly we have you know say struct stat, you know, we have um, in a new release we may change the type, but we may actually change what Dwarf thinks is the, you know, the compiler and everything thinks is the definition of that type, but we've done it in a compatible way because we just replaced some reserved padding field with a new field right. and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so without having a, from the binary point of view and for us, it would need to be from everybody, from the point of view of every binary everywhere in the world, um, without having that kind of checking, you need, I mean, I guess, you know, humans can just do this if the thing says, Replace Wait, the field underscore yeah. reserve with the field foobar. Yeah. But it it might be nice if uh, there was some more sort of automatic support for that. Like I can you know easily imagine some kind of attribute that's a little bit like deprecated that you put on the field for, that's like you know for your reserve padding field. Yeah. That both at compile time would say you should be using this, mm. uh, but also would inform the checker. That, that says, yeah, okay, this is safe. Uh, I mind. I really minded. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Then, then yeah. it's, you know, it's an okay kind of thing. Yeah, I think that'd be relatively easy to. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. 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 The annotations yeah. are like. So it'll be straight Yeah, where we yeah. do the whitelisting as in source at, with attributes and annotations, or in the, the X. Yeah, I mean, that the benefit of having it be you know yeah. attributes is that that yeah. is you know that is both that is also proactive. Use where you then, you know, right. it also leads to warnings about anything that actually uses the field as it must be doing Right, yeah. Um, you mean at compiled time? Yeah, at compiled time. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody yeah. Right. hits that, that right. attribute. Yeah. Right. So, so, right. so if we say, you know, we have struct set and it's got these, you know, four padding fields and now we've add, you know, we're using that. Uh, if some guy says, hey, I happen to be using this structure and I happen to use those as my scratch field, yeah. the thing, then. Um, well, this then happens. We, we, then, <laughs> then, then <laughs> it happens, but if we, if the, you know, and now we say you shouldn't have been done that. Well, I'm behave, blah, 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 screw you. But, uh, but if we could say the pilot told you and you the pilot told you you were doing something insane and you ignored it, that's yeah, that's much better. Yeah, right? yeah. But that, that's a real issue. I I, I spent a couple of weeks walking through one of these in the kernel space with the kernel team. Yeah, you know, this this stuff really does happen. They use a, 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 a reserve field. And nobody tells them until it breaks. Yeah. Right. One of the things we're not, I, I want to make sure. Awesome, thank you. You had another question, Roland. I want to make sure you get a chance yeah, to answer so it, a to ask it. Kind of side of the issue about the API side uh -huh. issues. So, so one thing is just in the presentation to, uh, you know, when, when you have, uh, you know, your report that a human looks at. Right. To make those very clear. I think API can check your already It's a pretty good job, I agree. Um, but I just sort of think sort of all through the stack to 